So good morning, good afternoon, good late night, uh, depending on where you are in the world. We've got a great show today. I'm very excited about it. We're hosting Dr. Chris Kenobi. You may have heard uh, some of his work. You may have seen some of it. Dr. Kenobi is an ophthalmologist, but instead of spending all of his time making money as an ophthalmologist, he donates huge portions of his time in preventing the diseases of the eye, mainly macular de degeneration and some other diseases that he'll talk about today. But this is not just about the eye. This is about overall health. You may have heard the term vegetable oils, seed oils, omega-6s. Again, uh, Dr. Kenobi is gonna help clear up a lot of that information for you today. As an epidemiologist, I've looked at this information in the past and I've gotten frustrated uh, with some of the challenges associated with what you'll see the epidemiologists call environmental epidemiology. Environmental epidemiology means it's not like a clinical trial. It's not randomized. There's no uh, little to no prospective nature to it. What you have to do is go back and look at the entire population and look at the trends in exposure, in this case, diet, and the associated resulting trends in health. In Dr. Kenobi's case, eye disease, but in Dr. Kenobi's case and in all of our cases, things like diabetes and early aging. So <clears throat> I think he's going to make a very strong case. As, as I settled down some of my epidemiological concerns and actually listened hard, I found that uh, the evidence that he was presenting was very, very good. I hope you will find, I, I hope and I believe you will find the same thing today. Chris? <clears throat> yes, Dr. Brewer. Uh, you, are you ready to go? We, we usually have a, uh, an introduction of our content, our show. Uh, but again, for the sake of getting your, con you've got a, a good series of, of slides. You've got a lot of good information that we have. Um, I know I haven't done your bio justice. Uh, if you'd like to add anything else before you get into the discussion today, please do so. But I'm going to skip over most of the intro information for the for the uh, channel today to give you more time. Oh, sure. No, you you said plenty about me. Um, I'm I'm ready just to get in uh, get into um, all of this. Uh, do you want me to sort of give an introduction to that? Before you do, we'll go ahead and, and we use this uh, next snippet as a way to manage our own content. Uh, Gilbert, if you'll give us the water ball, then we'll get into Chris's show. So here we go, Chris. Yeah, so um, so, so first of all, um, as Dr. Burr said, I'm a physician and ophthalmologist, uh, eye, eye surgeon. And um, I uh, basically have struggled with my own health issues um, that began in my, in my 30s with, with uh, arthritis and in 2011, I made some dietary changes and had this huge improvement in my arthritis. And um, it, it led me to, um, to investigate uh, the paleo diet. And um, I, I read Lauren Cordain's book, The Paleo Answer. And for the first time ever, uh, 21 years after graduating from medical school, I understood that processed foods are driving uh, the enormous bulk of the uh, chronic conditions uh, like uh, coronary heart disease, cancers, diabetes, and so on. And uh, anyway, so in uh, 2013, I eventually um, asked myself the question, could, it, could processed foods be driving age-related macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss 
and blindness in people over the age of 50 worldwide. And so I, uh, after studying that for about a year and a half, I was so convinced that that hypothesis held water that in 2015, I left practice to pursue that full time. And, and we ended up uh, looking at um, uh, processed foods using proxy markers of sugar and, and vegetable oils uh, as markers of processed food. And, um, the data supported that hypothesis in every single country. In other words, the higher the, the sugar and vegetable oil consumption, the greater the macular degeneration prevalence. So I, we published a paper, uh, introducing that hypothesis to the world. I published a book and started a nonprofit foundation. And, but by 2018 Ford, I just was no, I, I just would, could, began to become more acutely aware that the vegetable oil seemed to be the big driver of virtually all of the chronic disease. And so I began going public with that in 2019. So I, the last really about five years of my life has really been you know, looking at processed foods and vegetable oils versus um, all chronic disease. So again, coronary heart disease, strokes, cancer, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, of course, age-related macular degeneration, all the autoimmune diseases, and then all these rare diseases. And all of these um, seem to be strongly connected to um, to vegetable oils. So, so I'll go back here. The, the image we're looking at for those who are viewing this um, we're seeing on the left here a, a bunch of beautiful faces. Well, this is Weston A. Price's research. And um, for those who don't know him, Weston A. Price was a highly accomplished scientist, researcher, and dentist who in the 1930s traveled the world evaluating people on five continents, 14 nations, hundreds of tribes and villages, and thousands upon thousands of, of people um, who were in really two states of health, what they were, um, or, or, or two, two positions really, they were either continuing their native traditional diets or they had transitioned over to consuming westernized diets, which means they were consuming what they even called the foods of the white man. And um, those who were on their native traditional diets, we see their, their photos on the left here, these um, beautiful faces with beautiful, straight, natural uh, teeth um, that were unaffected, almost entirely unaffected by cavities or by um, uh, they weren't they weren't crooked. And these people literally had no no dentists, no toothbrushes, no toothpaste, no floss. Um, yet they had, you know, they were fantastically healthy and had these you know, brilliant teeth. And on the right, you see the uh, examples of the people that began to consume the, the westernized foods, the processed foods. And these were primarily, according to Price, um, refined white flour, refined sugar, vegetable fats, canned goods, sweets, confectionery. Uh, and, and well, basically that, and so processed foods. And, it, and for those who can see this, we see that these people are, have, you know, crooked teeth, lots of dental disease, dental abscesses, loss of teeth. Um, and ultimately, these people would go on to get um, much higher uh, risks, uh, much higher development of arthritis, cancer, um, and all sorts of birth defects and developmental disorders. So they had to develop degenerative disease. And what Price found, so Price evaluated these uh, native traditional populations diets, again, on five continents. And he sent, sent back thousands of samples of their foods for back to his labs in the United States and had them analyzed. And those native traditional foods contain 10 times as many fat soluble vitamins which is primarily a d and k2 uh, four times as many water soluble vitamins which is all the b vitamins and c and one and a half to 60 times more minerals than did the american diets of his day again that was the 1930s so you can imagine it's way worse today we we not only have a whole lot more processed food but even the the food that we have is not as nutrient dense
And um, so, uh, but again, so Price found that vegetable fats were part of the problem, but back in the 1930s, the vegetable oils were um, a very minor part of the food supply. And um, so, so what I have worked on is the correlations between increasing vegetable oil consumption and again as i said all chronic disease so we could look at coronary heart disease or cancer or diabetes and we could go through these if you, if you want to ford um but all of these have gone up exponentially just you might use the term infinitely in some of them um in correlation to processed foods but particularly in correlation to vegetable oils So do you want me just to continue here? Oh, I can't hear you. Okay. Um, so Sorry, Chris. yes. Are you able to see your slide? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So here, this is our uh, published uh, uh, graph. This came out in our paper that was related to macular degeneration back in 2017. And, um, and as you can see, that, well, this is, total vegetable oil consumption in the United States. So this is all edible oils. And if you go back to 1865, you'll notice that we had zero edible oils. And this is a time when we had virtually no chronic disease, uh, coronary heart disease, virtually unknown. There was eight papers worldwide on coronary heart disease in the 19th century. Um, and the clinicians were extraordinary in that era. Um, but anyway, so so uh, there was no vegetable oils in 1865. They entered the food supply right after the American Civil War in, in, uh, beginning about 1866. And you can see that they were pretty stable until about 1909. And then there was a big bump up. And that's when uh, soybean oil was added to the food supply. Mm -hmm. And uh, Procter & Gamble started producing Crisco which is a, you know, it's a cottonseed oil product. But anyway, so you see a big bump there in 1909 and you just see almost a steady increase um, overall uh, up through the latest data there is 2010. And you can see in 2010, we're at 80 grams of vegetable oil consumption per person per day. Well, 80 grams is 720 calories. That is 32% of U.S. caloric intake. And um, uh, that, so the, the vegetable oils have basically supplanted and replaced animal fats. And if you look back at the graph here, you can see in 1900, 99% of added fats came from animal fat. And this was a time, again, uh, when, uh, for example, obesity was 1.2%. Um, coronary heart disease was unknown. Alzheimer's disease had never been diagnosed, dementia that wasn't related to syphilis, never diagnosed. There wasn't a single case of age-related macular degeneration in the United States. Um, diabetes in 1890 in the United States, 2.8 per 100,000 people. Today, it's 13,000 per 100,000. Um, uh, so then if you look back at the graph, you can see that, well, this vegetable oil continued to increase by 2005, 86% of added fats came from vegetable oils. So again, the vegetable oils almost completely supplanted and replaced the natural animal fats. And with that, we've become obese, sick, uh, diabetic, uh, coronary heart disease gone through the roof today. Um, one out of three people in the United States dies of coronary heart disease. Another almost one in three dies of uh, cancer. And then, you know, the, the, the bulk of the rest of us are affected, affected by and or succumb to all of these other chronic diseases. But you can see, look at the graph and, and many authors, researchers have said, well, you know, a whole problem began in 1980 when, when uh, the U.S. dietary guidelines were released that told us to go low fat. And um, but you can see. So we actually we don't have this on the on the graph here, but. But we indeed did go low fat when we dropped our fat consumption from around 41 percent um, in 1980. And over the next decade, it dropped down um, to around 32 or 33 percent 
of the diet. So, but look at the, you can see that the vegetable oils kept going up. So while the um, fat consumption was going down, the greater portion of that became vegetable oils. And as everyone knows, we've got a massively increasing uh, prevalence uh, of obesity, diabetes, and cancer for sure. So Chris, a couple of questions. One of the big challenges here is sifting through definitions. You know, for some of us, uh, fats would, would include oils. And obviously that's not the way you're defining it. That's not the way you've, that it's defined on this slide. Um, another question would be. Well, these are, these are added fats. Um, on, on this, uh, you know, the, when I'm talking about the, at, you know, the 99% in 1900 is added fat. So that's not, um, and, and the 86% of added fats from vegetable oils. So that's not total fat consumption that that's the added fat. Uh, so that brings up a third quite, I had, I had uh, two questions that adds a third. What does added mean in this? Yeah. So this is not, so, so this doesn't account for the fats that you would consume in animal meat or eggs or milk or butter. Um, uh, so we're, we're talking about the, the fats that you would add to the diet here. Uh, when, when I, uh, you know, when, when we talk about the, uh, the two points there in 1900 versus 2005. So in other words, in other words, if you go clear back to 1865, no one added any fats to their diet that wasn't animal fat. It was lard, butter, and beef tallow, 100%. We didn't have any oils. I mean, there might've been a rare, you know, basically a rare person that had olive oil, <clears throat> but there were no other oils at all available up through 1865, not only for the United States, but for almost the entire world. And you can see by 2005, of those added fats <clears throat> so when people are adding fat to their diet um it's, instead of those being butter lard and beef tallows uh, uh, um, those became vegetable oils is really what happened so a couple of a couple of points and details around what that actually looked like yeah. so uh frying food that was basically using beef tallow and butter, correct? And lard, yes. And lard. Yeah. Until um, uh, cottonseed oil like Crisco became available. And then you, they, you saw a big increase in that. When did that become available? So Crisco entered the, the market in, in 1911. And yes, that was a cottonseed oil product. So it came from cottonseed oil. Um, and again, in 1909, soybean oil um, was introduced to the market. So again, that's why in 1909, you see a big jump there from about one to two grams of vegetable oils per day in 1908, um, up to nine grams a day in 1909. And I just get, I'll throw out a couple more numbers here for it. So 1960, uh, the vegetable oil consumption was 19 and a half grams per day. And you can see it just continues steadily climbing all the way to 80 grams per day by 2010. So again, that's 720 calories worth. That's, a, that's, that's roughly a third of the American diet, which didn't even exist at all in 1865. And in 1900 was one gram a day. So it was, you know, I mean, one gram is nine calories. So out of roughly, let's say 2,400 calories of consumption in 1900, they were consuming nine calories of that, of vegetable oil. So basically the way this data, these data were collected was <clears throat> up until then, there was no availability of these vegetable oils, mainly soybean and cottonseed. Once the industrial Re revolution came in and started making some of these changes that made it those available, they started looking at the major sources that were putting these out. Crisco and what was the major? What were the major sources for uh, soybean oil? Is it are they brand? Are there brand names we would recognize like Crisco? 
Um, well, so eventually, um, well, so, so soybean oil was used on its own in, in processed foods. It also became part of margarines. So the okay. margarine are, they, uh, is a mixture of butter and some kind of oil. And then, and then, you know, and then again, all of the other highly polyunsaturated vegetable oils followed. So once we had cottonseed and soybean oil, this was big, this was, uh, you know, big money to the industrialists of the time. There was a lot of money to be made in vegetable oils. So then we ended up getting, so you had soybean, uh, cottonseed, and then eventually, you know, canola, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, rice bran sesame and peanut oils those are the highly polyunsaturated oils that i say are the worst of the worst because they're high in omega-6 linoleic acid so so back to how this the the data were created or generated for research like this uh, basically there was a simple look at the major producers of these oils crisco and who and whoever was the major producers of the soybean oils and um, calculation of that going back into the total American diet. Yeah, it, it wasn't just soybean. It was all the, this, so this is all of the oils collectively. Okay. And the, the okay. So the rest of the omega-6 oils start getting added a little bit later yeah, after yes. 1911. Exactly. Exactly. Very interesting. Yeah. In, anything else on that slide? Well, so the 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 t you know the most important point we'll get to it is that the these omega six oils are uh, I mean these edible vegetable oils are high in omega six, and uh, uh, the omega six in these oils is ninety percent. Well, in fact, in any fat is about ninety percent omega six linoleic acid. That's the eighteen carbon omega six. And um, later, we've got another graph in here. We'll look at that consumption. But, but the, the general theme or thesis for it is that we, what happens to our bodies is that we accumulate fats in proportion to whatever those fatty acids are in our diet. So if we consume more omega-6 or more omega-3, that's reflected in our body fat and in our cell membranes and our inner in our mitochondrial membranes. And um, ultimately, we'll develop very, very high levels of omega-6 fat. And that ultimately sets up a biological environment where that is pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, directly toxic, and nutrient deficient. And so we can go through those if you want to, but but, but this is the reason essentially in, in a nutshell, that we develop so much chronic disease from these oils. So thank you for getting to that piece. I was te very tempted, having done a lot of binge watching on your content recently, and not really having that much uh, exposure, pardon the term, mm -hmm. uh, to this whole question prior to, again, some binge watching on your, your content recently. It, so basically, I, I was tempted to to spill the beans and say uh, I, I, it sounds like a lot of this concept, this is based on an assumption that it's harder for us to burn omega-6s. Exactly. So therefore, well, I, I don't believe we're needed. meant. Yeah, go ahead. So therefore, the omega-6s get deposited uh, more so in our fat and uh, stick around that fat is driving diabetes. Yes. Yes. So the yeah. so omega-6 linoleic acid and omega-3 alpha linolenic acid are the both the, the 18 carbon molecules. They are the essential fatty acids. We must have those in our diet, but you cannot get too little if you eat food. Um, it's impossible. Uh, if that it really doesn't matter what kind of food you eat, even the foods that are incredibly low in fat, like white rice or apples or bananas or pears or whatever, they all have fats and they all contain those two fats and in enough quantity that I'm convinced it's, it, it's literally impossible to get too little. And this is, this comes from data like in hunter gatherers that have extremely low 
uh, omega-6 and omega-3 consumption. Um, is, and uh, But the problem is, is when we get too much and the dose makes the poison. So, so anything, I, I've been looking at this for about four years. And what I've noticed is that the hunter gatherer populations that don't have vegetable oils, they of course never would have those. So I should also say hunter gatherers or pastoralists or uh, um, uh, agriculturists, all of them like subsistence agriculturists, all of them have a, do not have vegetable oils, of course, and they all have an omega-6 linoleic acid consumption in their diet of under 2%. Um, whereas we've been, uh, the, the typical Western populations now are, to, are around between six and 12%, most of them between seven and 12%. And um, I would suggest uh, that anything above about three three percent is too much anything above two percent really is too much um above um but the higher you get above two percent the more likely you will develop chronic disease so <clears throat> basically what you're saying is uh, omega-6 is like linoleic uh linolenic are difficult to burn. They're using things like maybe hormones and stuff like that. So they're essential, but you don't need the amount that we're getting. Once right. you get I, that essential component, which you're going to get as long as you eat any kind of food based on a practical basis, right. you, you cover that. And then it becomes a poison just because you get way, way too much, just like carbohydrates can become a poison for those of us who can't tolerate many of them. Yeah, so you know, uh, way back in I think the 16th, 17th century, Paracelsus said the dose makes the poison, and right. it doesn't really matter what it is; anything can become poisonous at the high at at the, at the right dose. Um, so there's really a sweet spot for everything, including oxygen, water, um, linoleic acid, you name it. So so linoleic acid. Some people have started looking at this and some of this work that I've been doing, and they come to the conclusion that linoleic acid is a poison. It is absolutely not as an essential ingredient, just like, you know, vitamin A or vitamin D to the, to the diet. Um, uh, but it's, there's a critical uh, amount that we should be getting. And we're getting much, much, much greater than that in westernized diets. And it's almost exclusively because of vegetable oils. There's some other reasons we can get into that if you want to, but. but uh, that's very helpful. Uh, I spent a good bit of my time as an occupational medicine doc and very, very heavy emphasis on toxicology. And you're preaching to the choir on the issue about the dose makes the poison. Water can be a poison, air can be a poison. And just look at the, you know, neonatal kids, oxygen can be a poison for these for these kids if they're not ready for it. Yeah. And obviously drowning can show where uh, uh, too much water can be poisoned as well. So right. yes, so, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and get uh, further back into your content, but uh, thank you for the, for uh, tolerating the questions. Sure. Yeah. So should we go on to the next slide? Uh, yep. <clears throat> so here we published this in 2017 this is saturated fat and vegetable oil versus heart disease deaths in the United States. And, and you can see it, go, it, it ranges um, chronologically from 1900 on the far left to um, 2020 on the far right. And you can see that we've got heart disease deaths in the red um, and vegetable oil curve in the black and then saturated fat in the purple. And for those who can see this, you'll see this remarkable correlation between the vegetable oils and the heart disease deaths. Um, they just they just track together uh, very strongly. But the saturated fat you can see is virtually flat throughout the entire 20th century. So it increased um, five grams per day, which basically one teaspoon worth of fat during the entire century. So we have no correlation at all here between heart disease deaths and saturated fat. And I would submit if we had published this back in 1961 um, instead of 2017, I don't know how anybody could have ever, 
ever looked at this and decided that saturated fat is a, is a cause, even a cause of coronary heart disease would make no sense because we, because coronary heart disease was again virtually unknown in 1900, and even in 1910 it was it was unknown. First first documented uh, heart attack in the United States um, was documented by James Herrick, physician, in 1912, um, documented with autopsy evidence. Um, uh, up through the 1890s and early 1900s, um, there was uh, there was virtually with all of the research, all of the uh, textbooks and all that. There's no evidence that coronary heart disease was causing heart attacks. Um, so, so there might have been coronary heart disease there, but it wasn't that all that significant. But by the 1930s, coronary heart disease became the leading cause of death, and it's remained that way ever since. And th so people will sometimes ask, well. You see coronary, you see heart disease deaths going down since about the 1980s or 90-ish, and uh, but vegetable oil is still going up. And the answer there is, is the smoking has gone way down since the 1960s. Smoking has gone down, and we've got all of the medical and surgical treatment for heart patients that's probably helping some. So, um, so that's the reason that there's a, a disparity there. So I've got both in my personal life and professional life, I've got uh, quite a few vegans and they get so irritated with me when I quote Nina Teicholz's book, The Big Fat Surprise. And then even more irritated when I quote a couple of the, uh, the meta-analyses that that book stimulated. And I've become very skeptical of saturated fat as a major cause as well. Uh, Jeannie, any comments? Well, I can see that the 80s when they really pushed the low fat uh, cheese and low fat everything. And that really was a, a catalyst of a lot of problems. And, you know, I grew up in that era of Diet Coke and low fat. And that's why we have so many people in their 50s and 60s with problems now. Yeah. So, I mean, for those, if uh, you know, to, uh, to me, of course, I've been working at this for 12 years. So I am. Um, um, I'm, I'm skewed, but I just, I just feel like the uh, saturated fat versus heart disease deaths, uh, heart disease, uh, ought to be a dead subject, but, um, but I, I'll give the audience a couple of examples. So, so in 1972, George Mann studied the Maasai tribe of Kenya and Tanzania and, um, the Maasai tribe, they're pastoralists. They, they raise cattle and they're, uh, their food is almost exclusively the milk, meat, and blood of the cattle they herd. <clears throat> in fact, in the Muran cohort, which is the men aged, or well, they're boys to men, but uh, the males aged 14 to about 34, they're prohibited from eating anything other than milk, meat, and blood. They cannot have any fruits or vegetables whatsoever. Um, so George Mann studied them. They had 350 uh, uh, people that they examined uh, I think they were over age 40 uh, with EKGs. They did another another 50 autopsies. This took a number of years. And there was one possible uh, silent MI in all 400 of them. Um, there wasn't one single, you know, documented myocardial infarction that, you know, presented with, uh, with, with symptoms. Um, and yet their diet was 66% animal fat. And that worked out to be uh, 40 to 46% saturated animal fat. So um, th this is the highest known animal fat diet of any diet in the world. It included, in fact, it's even substantially higher than the Inuit, um, which, which are uh, virtually complete carnivores. Um, uh, and yet, again, they had no coronary heart disease. Um, another one would be a uh, population that ought to be mentioned really is the Tokelauans. And um, so the Tokelauans are in the South Pacific and their diet is coconut, fish, starchy tubers and fruit. They were studied by um, Ian Pryor and colleagues, if I remember right, that might be wrong. Um, and um, they, so their diet uh, is also a very high fat diet, 53% fat, um, because it's coming from coconut. Coconut is very highly saturated. 
It's 91 to about 95% saturated fat. So their diet is 40, I'm sorry, it's 50% saturated fat. Um, so it was, it was, I think, 49% in the men and 51% in the women. It averaged 50% saturated fat. That is the highest saturated fat diet ever documented for any population. I mean, half of their diet saturated fat. And yet they absolutely, in 1982, they had 0% of men between 40 and 69 years of age documented with any coronary heart disease, any, any heart attack. Um, they had virtually no obesity and no diabetes. They were phenomenally healthy people. So, so what should that tell us about saturated fat and coronary heart disease? It just really is, it's absolutely not the driver. I can't help but smile because <clears throat> of something that I see in my practice. And I saw the epitome of it two weeks ago. It was a, a fellow that um, was about 80 pounds overweight. He went on a um, vegan diet, lost 25 pounds, decided he could not continue that, switched and went all the way to the other extreme on a carnivore diet, lost 25 more pounds, uh, and now he's fishing around trying to decide what his next diet's going to be. But his health has dramatically improved from where it was 50 pounds ago. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, that I see over and over again, we get we get a little bit too wrapped up, I think, in debates over sources um, and um, and types of calories and forget obesity as such a major driver. Right. Right. Anything else on this slide? No, I don't think so, Ford. I think we covered it. So here we see this is the omega-6 linoleic acid consumption. Again, remember that um, uh, linoleic acid is about 90% of the omega-6 fat in any kind of fat. Um, you know, regardless of the source in, in, in food. And so it, what we did, we modeled our group, um, the, um, the American diet in 1865 before we had any uh, seed oils, before we had any vegetable oils at all. And when all animals were raised ancestrally, in other words, they weren't corn and soy fed, uh, including corn and soy fed uh, pork and uh, chicken, which can be very high in omega-6. And uh, but anyway, you can see that the um, average consumption of omega-6 linoleic acid in 1865 was about 2.4 grams or 1.1 percent of the diet. Remember, I was saying that um, ancestrally living populations, their their diets are under 2 percent omega-6 linoleic, linoleic acid. You can see that by 1909, that number had doubled. Um, uh, oh, like it's got the wrong number there on it. it, it, it well, the 2.23 percent is accurate, but it shouldn't say 2.4 grams. It should have been uh, 4.8 grams. I believe it is. Um, but you can see the trend continues up. So it's um, 7.21 percent omega-6 linoleic acid in 1999 and 11.8 percent omega-6 linoleic acid in 2008. So we went from 1.1 percent in 1865 to um, whatever this is about 145 years later to 11.8% uh, omega-6 linoleic acid. That's um, an 11 fold increase in omega-6, whether you look at it by mass or by percentage. And this I will submit is the primary driver of, of obesity and all of our chronic disease, because again, this is the, the, this fat will accumulate this, the, this omega-6 fat will accumulate in our body fat and in our cell membranes and our inner mitochondrial membranes and drive this pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic and nutrient deficient environment uh, causing all of, all of this disease. Are you familiar with, uh, with an award winning lecture called the secret life of fat cells? I don't think so, Ford. It was um, it won a lot of awards in the diabetes community, and basically it talked about how fat cells generate 
diabetes, prediabetes, especially when, as they grow, you know, when we grow our fat, it's not that we're adding more fat cells, we're growing each cell. And as each cell begins to grow, it begins to lose its access to, um, to the vascular system. And those cells become, they don't technically become zombie cells, but they begin to act like them. They start releasing hormones cytokines, things that drive diabetes. So <clears throat> yes, I would agree with, with your statement that uh, anything causing increase in fat is going to be causing this problem. I think that's, I don't think there's any debate over that at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So here we see um, obesity uh, prevalence in, uh, in the red versus vegetable oils in the blue. And anyone could look at this and see there's this extraordinary relationship between the two. So back when in 1900, when obesity was 1.2%, now that was in men age 18 to 80. That's Scott Allen Carson's work um, from prisoners in the 19th century. Um, that's what obesity was, 1.2%. Uh, uh, there was no data on women, um, but we... You, pretty much can surmise that they're the same. But anyway, you can see vegetable oils then again, about one gram per day. If you jump over to 1961, when, when this is when most, you know, a lot of modern researchers will say, you know, they, they act as though everything was hunky dory. We're just in great shape in 1961 when obesity was 13.4%. But notice obesity had already risen 11 fold because the problem was in place after 1865, when the vegetable oils entered the, the food supply, of course, well, and processed foods are going up. But as you track along forward by 2018, you can see obesity at 42 and a half percent. And at that time, another 31.4 percent of Americans are overweight. So you have right at around 74 percent of Americans either obese or overweight in 2018. There was 1.2 percent obesity in 1900. Um, but again, in, in 2018, our uh, seed oil consumption was roughly still approximately 80 grams a day. So you see this extraordinary correlation between the two. And we could go on to the next slide. So here, so I put sugar back into the mix. And this comes from our team. Um, this is, these, these two are not published in a scientific literature yet. That's pending. But anyway... Here we've got sugar in here, and this is really interesting because you can see that um, the sugar was actually very high. Even in 1890, sugar was 10.8% of the um, caloric consumption. Um, and uh, by, um, by 1935, sugar was 22.5% of the diet. And yet you can see obesity was probably around three or 4% in 1935. And between 1935 and 2018, sugar barely increased. Uh, well, I shouldn't say barely, but it only went up one and a half percent as an absolute number percentage of the diet. So we went from 22 and a half percent of our diet as sugar in 1935 to 24% of our diet as sugar in 2018. And yet obesity went from around three or 4% in 1935, it's estimated, up to 42.5% in 2018. So the sugar increased, I'll, I'll give you the absolute number, it increased 86 calories between 1935 and 2018. Um, and, and then you can see that after 1999 or 2004, depending on what data set you look at, but because there's a couple of those where they're slightly different, just slightly different. But at least since at least since 2004, sugar has been on the decline while obesity continues to rise. So I think obesity was around 30, uh, 30 or 31 um, percent in 2000, and of course now we're at 42 and a half percent. But all this time, the sugar has been going down. So, again, since 2004, um, carbohydrates have been going down since 1997 and um, total calories have been going slightly down since 2000 um, or just virtually stable. It's a flat line. So while, so while calories, carbohydrates and sugars all going down, 
obesity and diabetes have gone through the roof. We've had our greatest increases, but the one thing that is still going up is the vegetable oils. So Chris, I've seen this before, and that's one of the key questions that I had for you. I have focused on carbohydrates and a lot of it's been based on uh, watching people become insulin resistant. Um, when I saw sugars, I, I, I've never felt like sugars were the major source. I've always felt like it was grain products. Just then you mentioned carbohydrates. So are you including rice, wheat, uh, corn, all those uh, grain products under the term sugars in this graph? Okay, so sugars, this data uh, comes from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. It's the only data that any researcher would use, uh, you know, for data after 1961, because there really is no other data. So you have to, you have to, uh, that's the only source for that, really. And their definition of sugars includes all added sugars to the diet. So that would be you know, table sugar, that includes cane sugar, beet sugar, um, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, um, maple syrup, honey, um, and all sugar sweetened beverages. So it, any kind of sugar that's been added to the diet, once again, added, these are not natural existing sugars. So just to, this would not include fruit sugar, for example, or vegetables or vegetable sugar. So, you know, those are not tracked in this. So again, the, the sugars that occur naturally in the food, which is, you know, almost exclusively fruit and, you know, much smaller amounts in the vegetables, those are not tracked here, but all the other, the, so all the added sugars to the diet is what's in that green curve right there. So that sounds to me as I, as I sift through that and listen, it sounds like it's really going to be mostly high fructose corn syrup added to different uh, produced foods. Is that is that a fair statement or do you need to clarify it? I don't really know exactly what the you know what what the breakdown in the percentages would be. I mean, you, you can uh, that could be extracted. Um, I'm sure that pretty pretty significant percentage of that would be high fructose corn syrup i just don't know how much for it um so we never tried to we never tried to split that out especially you know given that uh you know table sugar and high fructose corn syrup you know there's very very little difference metabolically even robert lustig has you know said repeatedly for uh i think 15 years and, and I, I don't think he's changed his tune that metabolically high fructose corn syrup and, and table sugar are identical when it comes to my you know, metabolic standpoint. I mean, so the high fructose corn syrup sure might be 55% fructose. It's a little bit higher in fructose than the 50% fructose in table sugar, but metabolically they're, you know, he, he claims they're virtually identical, which seems, uh, you know, seems about the same to me. Anything else on that slide? Uh, just, you know, the, the bottom line here is that we, there is virtually no correlation here between between sugar and, and, and obesity, even a negative correlation or inverse correlation since 1999 or 2004. Sugar is going down while obesity goes up. So those who want to make the argument that, that this is all about obesity, well, um, they have this to contend with. That's pretty, that's pretty difficult. You know, when you, when you see this, uh, you see these trends. Uh, let me clarify the last statement. You, I thought you said those that want to say this is all about obesity have this to contend with. Did you mean those that say this is all about sugar? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I would agree if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. Okay. Well, I'm dropping my sugars. Well, you know, that's a few that's a few carbs out of your diet, but very few compared, yeah. compared to the overall sources in your diet. Anything else? No, no, we can go on. Yeah, so this is, um, so here we're looking at diabetes versus sugar. And um, I think this is extremely interesting because if you go back to 1890, um, this was so sort of the most famous physician, perhaps in all uh, of all time, maybe, uh, maybe second only to Hippocrates was, 
Sir William Osler, um, who in his first textbook of medicine, Principles and Practice of Medicine in 1893, he reported the prevalence of diabetes for the United States in 1890, and it was 0.0028%. That's 2.8 per 100,000 people. Um, jump clear to the far right, and in 2016, you can see that 13% of the population, or 13,000 per 100,000, now have diabetes. But in 1890, when diabetes was 0.0028%, um, look at the sugar consumption. It was already 10.8% of the diet. So the World Health Organization tells us today um, that we should not be consuming more than 10% of our diet as sugar um, and, and, you know, makes a strong case or they try to make a strong case that, you know, sugar is driving obesity and diabetes. But look at this. So, you know, we already had 10.8% of our diet as sugar and uh, diabetes was extraordinarily rare. In fact, there was only about 1700 diabetics in the entire United States. And I think that was almost uh, 70 million people. Um, uh, you know, so while the population uh, increased um, between 1890 and 2016, increased about five fold, diabetes increased 4,643 fold uh, over that period of time. But so if again, jump over there to 1935, 36, that's when the diabetes was then documented to be 0.37%. So you can see that um, it had increased about 135 fold from the 1890 level um, and sugar was 22 and a half percent. But again, notice that we've got this extraordinary increase in diabetes from 0.37% in 1935 um, to, you know, you see it go up to 2.97% by uh, 1990, I think it was, and then all the way to 13% by 2016. But look where the sugar is, it's 24% in 2016. So there's, again, only 86 calories worth of sugar difference or 1.5% of the diet between 1935 and 2016, while diabetes uh, ele elevates from 0.37% to 13%. So again, we just have virtually no correlation here between diabetes and sugar consumption. But again, you, you know, this is, you see this extraordinary correlation between diabetes and vegetable oils. You got a minute for, you're getting into one of my favorite rants, the underdiagnosis of uh, diabetes and insulin resistance. Have you got a minute for me to? Yeah, to of course. Absolutely. So that 13% is for the most part, um, in some studies based on uh, A1C. The vast majority of diabetes is actually picked up by um, unintended fasting glucose, even today. And, you know, if you ask a typical doc, a doc will say, oh, no, the best test is A1C. The reality is they may say that, but they don't use it. Even if they did, it's not the right one. The um, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists has said that A1C is a problem. It's not the right test for diagnosing diabetes because it's a hemoglobin test. And things like genetics, uh, kidney disease, liver disease, all these things that impact hemoglobin can impact that. So we do a ton of um, craft insulin surveys, OGTTs, uh, insulin responses. And it's really clear <clears throat> If you go back to the CD, that, that this is way underdiagnosed. If you go back to the CDC, they'll say um, diabetes, prediabetes, by the time you're age 60, it's about 30% underdiagnosed. And they're wrong. They, their site has been, that's an underestimate uh, that they haven't changed in years, despite the fact that studies from UCLA indicated it was half starting at age 30. Uh, you say, well, you know, good thing I'm not from, and that was for California. And, and some people could say, well, good thing I'm not from California. That sounds like a hotbed of diabetes and prediabetes. Yeah. Did you mean half uh, are either diabetic or prediabetic? Is that what you meant? Correct. Yes. So then another study came out. It was the national study. It was uh, 
published in uh, JAMA Network found the exact same thing. By the time we're age 30, over half of us have enough diabetes or prediabetes to, go, to cause damage. Now, why is it so underreported? You know, uh, there's evidence about that. Mayo, uh, Mayo first started documenting, and then Harvard, Hopkins, and others have shown that two thirds of our primary care docs, uh, family practitioners, internists, even cardiologists, don't know how to diagnose this disease, let alone treat it. So that 13% diabetes prevalence, I would say it's much, much higher than that. Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously using uh, numbers here. I always would use, you know, the most conservative proven numbers that, that no one can argue with. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, if we put on here the diabetes and prediabetes, that number in 2016, I think, was, at, as you were saying, as 51%. Yeah. And that's, that's you know, that's all uh, published evidence. But as you know, the recently the number of Americans, adult Americans proven to be cardiometabolic, you know, the essentially cardiometabolically unhealthy, 93%, or they couldn't meet five criteria of cardiometabolic health, 93%. Now so, that is more accurate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is really what Kraft showed uh, way back in the 80s or 90s, whenever he did his research, that, that already by then, um, I, I think it was close to 90% of the population um, did not have normal uh, insulin responses, right? Well, it, it, he did it by generation, the diabetes epidemic in you. It was the book he wrote. And I believe it was by the time he got to the to the 80s, it was like way over two thirds had, uh, I think, full diabetes, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, big, big age related uh, problem. Right. And I, I would submit for that the, the one thing here that the, the reason that well over 90 percent of our population cannot meet five criteria of cardiometabolic health is because not probably 98 percent of the population is consuming seed oils and, and maybe it could be even higher than that but but the enormous majority of people are consuming these because they just don't recognize they're even there you just don't see them you know people see the carbs and they see the meat and see the protein and um but they don't really recognize the seed oils. They're, they're really the, the hidden factor that people just don't think about. Anything else on that slide? No, I don't think so. So here we see this is cancer deaths um, versus um, vegetable oils and sugar. And um, if you go back to 1811, and this all, this all again, everything I will say is all published evidence, or I won't say it or write it or publish it anywhere. But you can see in 1811 in the town of the town of Boston, Massachusetts, um, one of 188 people died of cancer. That's 0.5 percent. So by 1900, that had already increased to 5.8 percent of the population. One in 17. Um, and then if you look at the most recent data, I think that's around 2009 or 10, um, 30, oh yeah, there it is. 2010, sorry. 31.1% of the population dying of cancer. Again, this is the United States. And you can see that there's, there's correlation here between sugar and vegetable oils. And I think, you know, sugar may probably might have an effect here because it certainly is a nutrient deficient food. And it could be could be part of the problem, but um, but I, again, I uh, I'm absolutely convinced that the main problem main driver here is the vegetable oils. And in animal studies, so Clement Ip did it did a number of rodent studies back in um, back in the late 80s, I believe it was, um, or early 90s, and um, they he put animals on. Uh, varying diets of omega-6, starting at 0.5%, increasing at approximately 0.5% increments up to 4.4%, and then, and then big increments up to around 11%. Um, 
omega-6 linoleic acid. And then, but they, then they exposed these animals to a carcinogen, DMBA. And what he showed is that you had this increasing consumption, or I'm, I'm sorry, increasing development of cancers up to about 4.4% omega-6 LA. And then after that, it just, it just, you know, it uh, leveled off. And even up to 11, 11% omega-6 LA didn't produce much more cancer than the 4.4% LA. So that was the threshold essentially. And, um, and, and what's interesting about that is that all westernized po populations are above 4.4% omega-6 LA. So they're all kind of at the maximum risk for cancer based on omega-6 omega consumption. You know, one of the concerns I have about this, it, it's a question. The age, uh, the lifespan increased significantly between those years. And cancer is much more of an age-related uh, problem. No, well, there wasn't any adjustment for age, was there? Well, uh, this is just plain old cancer deaths, but I, I can address the age too. And that's in, that's in the book. Uh, Cause it's, you know, what uh, to me widely misunderstood because people will look at the, they'll just look at the, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to, I, I just blanked on the term, um, but the, the, the mean age of death, essentially the um, uh, life expectancy at birth LEB um, mm -hmm. In 1900 in the United States, for example, and they'll see that it's like something like 49.7 years and they'll say, well, everybody just dropped dead at age 50. And that's a, just absolutely untrue. There's not a single population like that in all of history. Um, what, what's is so incredibly important to realize that worldwide, um, you know, up until the early, you know, the early 20th century, um, the, the childhood death rate was extraordinarily high. So in 1800, 43.3% of the world's children did not survive to their fifth birthday. And by in 1900, it wasn't much better. 36.2% of the world's children did not survive to their fifth birthday. And in 1900, 4% of women died in childbirth, approximately, it was about one to one and a half percent uh, uh, risk of death per birth. Um, and so the typical woman was having around five children, I think on average. So you put those two together, you, this is what drops the, the life expectancy at birth way down. Um, you know, a, an example would be, um, a, you know, family of three, the, the, the father lives to age 80 and the mother lives to age 70, but the child dies in infancy. So the average age of death for that population of three is 50 years, right? And this is what we see in history. And I'll give you a couple of examples here. So, um, you know, this is, there's really good data on longevity and survival in England and Wales. And I happen to have the, the, uh, the, the numbers handy here. Um, in 1891, 50% of the population was alive past age 52. 30% alive past age 66, 20% alive past age 73, and 5% alive past age 85. So that's 1891. So 1911 in England and Wales, 64% of the population still alive past age 50, 53% alive past age 60, 36% alive past age 70. So again, more than a third of them still alive after age 70 and 15% alive after age 80. And this is kind of what we see even in hunter gatherers. Uh, the, the, the numbers are pretty similar. They're a little bit lower, but Gervin and Kaplan showed this back in 1991. I think they looked at a large number of hunter gatherer populations. And just like the, 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 the world in the, in the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries, where the children, so many of the children die uh, before age three. Um, the situation is the same for hunter gatherers. They have a very, very high death rate, um, in, uh, children because they don't have, you know, there's a uh, lack of good, clean, potable water. There's lack of sewer systems and they don't have any medical care at all. Um, you know, even an IV would save a lot of uh, IV fluids would save a lot of children. But in any case, 
Um, so Gervin and Kaplan uh, determined that the modal or the, which is basically the most common age of death for even for hunter gatherers was 72. And the range was something like 67 to 79, as I recall, um, typical. So the, yeah, these are hunter gatherers. And they, so they're not living much shorter. They, they, I think the most recent average uh, age of death for Americans is around 76. So the hunter gatherers are not much different. Um, which would be, you know, pretty similar to the situation for people in the 19th century all over the world. That's interesting. My mom is uh, comes from a family. She was born in 1931, and there were like 10 siblings. One died at age four. One died neonatal death about the time of birth. Um, one died uh, from trauma on the farm in the early 20s, and the rest of them made it into the late 80s and 90s. So your point is, if that's what we're looking at, um, can't this this concept about cancer deaths, you should still see a lot of cancers because once you got past the youth, those early deaths, you still had longevity. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. So well, you, you, you don't see cancer in hunter-gatherer populations that don't have processed foods and seed oils. It just does not. It simply doesn't exist. The, the Maasai don't have cancer, again, eating you know milk, meat, and blood. The Catavans, studied by Staff and Lindeberg back in the early 90s, they had one case of cancer historically in the entire population. Um, the Papua New Guineans of, of Tuca Sinta, um, that are uh, subsistence agriculturists, they had um, uh, virtually no cancer, as I'm aware of. Um, I, there's some other uh, populations that are pretty similar, where you just uh, oh the the uh, one of the most famous is the um, um, the uh, Inuit. Um, they were studied. Um, I can't think of that, that researcher's name, um, but, but anyway, they were studied back uh, around the turn of the 20th century, and uh, they looked at evidence over decades of time, and um, they could not, there just simply was no cancer cases in the Inuit, what, what people once called the Eskimos. Um, uh, they just couldn't, basically just couldn't find it in any of those that were living on their traditional diet, which is, as you know, they were they're, mo they're the most carnivorous population on the planet historically because they're, they're living off of uh, seal meat and blubber, whale meat and blubber, fish, caribou, reindeer, um, and then tiny, tiny amounts of uh, vegetable matter in, the sum in, their, in their about month-long summer. They would get whortleberries and a little bit of seaweed, and that was it. So the rest of the, the rest of the year, they had to live off of meat, off of animal meats, essentially. So there's a lot of populations that have been shown not to have any appreciable cancer, which is pretty similar to Americans way back in 1811, as you can see. Pretty rare, pretty, pretty unusual, pretty almost rare. I'm going to warn you before we get there. Um, Jeannie is from... Uh, our a met, the Mediter a Mediterranean culture. Mm -hmm. So she's got a lot of uh, personal connections she can bring back to that. Um, you can deal with it now if you want, or, uh, I, or I tell you what, why don't we uh, give Jeannie a little time to thank in you as well. And let's talk about Mediterranean diet a little bit later as you get, as you get wrapped, as you, as you start wrapping up. <laughs> okay. That sounds good. That sounds good. I love this stuff. Um, so here we're looking at global vegetable oil consumption. This graph is in a paper that is currently um, a, a being considered for publication in the uh, um, in the journal Nutrients. Um, but and I don't know why, but this graph looks a little different. Uh, that black line there. But any any case, the 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 point here is that we're, we've estimated vegetable oil consumption globally. Um, going clear back uh, into the 19th century. And if you go clear back to 1865, you can see that the, um, the estimated uh, consumption was of 
vegetable oils was almost zero globally. So very uh, only a small percentage of the population, maybe 5%, had any access to any kind of edible oils whatsoever. Um, those mostly would have been the, the healthier oils like um, tiny, tiny amounts of olive oil, coconut oil, palm oil, sesame oil. Um, and that's about it. And then you can see that that we have this steady increase after 1865, but mostly since 1900 um, increasing. And we were, uh, uh, we, we ended up all the way at 65 grams per person per day. Again, this is worldwide um, at the end of the graph there, which is 2013, 65 grams uh, of vegetable oils again. And the world had virtually none in 1865. So, and along with this, you can see this is our estimated increase in chronic disease, that red line right there. So we just have this, we again, have a very, very strong correlation. Anything else on that? No, that's it. And, and this is global um, evidence uh, for obesity in men versus sugar and vegetable oil. So again, you can see since the, uh, since the 1980s, the sugar consumption is just virtually flat. So between 1975 and 2014, sugar's up 5%, but the vegetable oils in blue there, you see they climbed 85%, which is approximately a doubling of the vegetable oils during this period, 1975 to 2014. But look at the obesity climbs from 3.2% in men to 10.8%. So it's up 3.4 fold. Uh, obesity in men. So we can go on to the next one because it'll be virtually the same, but it'll be obesity in women. So we see the same thing here. So I won't repeat the evidence. Sugar flat, vegetable oils approximately doubling between 1975 and 2014. Obesity in women climbs from 6.4% to 14.9%, right? Perfectly tracking with the vegetable oils. And we can go on to the next one. And then here we see, uh, again, uh, this is carbohydrate globally. So uh, between 1964 and 2014, so the carbohydrate dropped just slightly there. It looks like it, it's more than what it is, that the drop is from 64% um, to 62.5%, I believe it was in carbohydrate during, the, during this period. Um, so just down one and a half percent um, but again, while the, the average BMI in men, right, you know, elevated from 21.7 uh, in 1974 to 24.2 um, in 2014. So that's an average weight gain in men of 18 pounds, 8.2 kilos during this time. But again, while the, while the carbohydrates are going down slightly, and we can go on to the BMI in women next. Before we do, uh, okay. source of the of the term and definition of the term carbohydrate. That's all all carbohydrate, no matter what it is, all carbohydrate. And you got that from FAO, the food. Yes. And this is from the FAO. Yeah, they've got global data. Um, yeah. This, this is BMI in women and same situation. You see the carbohydrates slightly decrease globally um, between 1960s and 2014. And the BMI increased from 22.1. Again, that's a uh, body mass index, 22.1 in 1974 to 24.4 .4 in 2014. So that's an average weight gain in women of 14 pounds, 6.4 kilos during that period of time. And then here we see diabetes. Again, this is global again, and we're looking at sugar and vegetable oils versus diabetes. Um, so diabetes in, in men in 1980, 4.3%. And in 2014, um, it's 9.0%. So diabetes doubles. But again, while the sugar is actually down 1.7% globally during this period and vegetable oils rise during this period, 55%. So again, we're looking at between 1980 and 2014, 
um, uh, vegetable oils rise 55%. So that's 1.55 fold essentially. So uh, once again, how do you blame sugar? What, you know, the diabetes in men doubles while the sugar is on the slight decline. And we could go on to the next, and this is diabetes in women. And again, it just looks like an identical graph and it practically is. Again, sugar flat, vegetable oils um, up 55% and diabetes in women climbs from 4.0% 4, 4 in 1980 to 7.9% in 2014, uh, essentially doubles. And, and then this is just the global food trend. So again, for, from approximately 1961 to 2014, we see um, during this period, now the exact dates are below. So we see carbohydrates are down between 1964 and 2007, worldwide down 1.4%. Sugars during that period, 1961 to 2014 are up 20.2%. 20 but look at the vegetable oils, they're up between 1961 and 2014, um, edible oils are up 322%. That's 4.22 fold and global obesity and chronic disease just, you know, kind of through the roof, right? So, uh, very, very interesting, very helpful. If I could just um, give you some of my perspectives. I've always been uh, focused on um, it's not quite so much the, I, I've agreed with, I think we've all agreed again with obesity being a driver of disease, killing us. And then the question is, well, what's causing all this obesity? Um, I think we'd agree on several other things, addictive behavior with the individual, the culture, uh, big food, uh, processed food, but then you get into some questions about, okay, what about the uh, the macros and where are they coming from? Still a lot of debate about saturated fat. I think you and I are uh, in agreement, but there's still a huge component of folks saying saturated fat's a major driver. And, you know, we know that. Uh, sugars, I would agree with you. I don't think sugars are that big of a driver. I just, uh, I struggle with the, the last two slides about overall carbohydrates, because I just see too many people um, cutting, coming in, having obesity problems, cutting their carbs and getting a, a huge improvement in obesity. Uh, but here's the thing. I was always skeptical of the um, of the, in, the basically mostly environmental epidemiology, and, and you still use that for the seed oils, but I'm not nearly so skeptical anymore. I think you're, you present a really good case. I think there's a lot of good evidence there. And I, I suspect at the end of the day, it's gonna be sort of like the six blind men and the elephant. There's gonna be several people that are right, not just one thing, but uh, we'll have to see about that. Any. Any counter, any comments before we get to the debate on Mediterranean diet? Uh, yeah, uh, just one thing, Ford. Um, so I, I presented this at the uh, regarding this, you know, the the carbohydrates uh, and uh, you know the, the issues with insulin resistance and obesity and all that. Well, well, the um, so the NIH uh, looked at this data. And, um, and I have a graph on that. It's too bad I don't have it here right now, but um, or it's a table, sorry. It's the top 15 sources of omega-6 linoleic acid in the United States diet. And it's very recent. And of those top 15 sources of omega-6 linoleic acid, 11 of them are high carb. So what we have to realize mm. is that, see, the thing is, is every time people are consuming potatoes, pasta, rice, particularly those things, they're all associated with fat and with in the and in processed foods, all processed foods, I don't care what it is, and all restaurant food and all fast food, every single one of those is going to be associated with vegetable oil. So when people take bread, pasta, potatoes, rice, and you know, similar components, even refined flours out of their diet, they unknowingly, unwittingly remove vegetable oils. 
And this is a huge component, I believe, to the success of low carb diets. And I do believe low carb diets are working, but not in my view, not because of the fact that they're low carb. You know, for example, you know, why is it in 1909, and this is Tanya Blasbog's uh, published research from the NIH, in the United States, 37% of the diet was coming from grains. So that was primarily wheat, corn, um, rice, and oats, and um, 37%. And yet obesity was around 1%. Um, and uh, diabetes was, again, extraordinarily rare in 1909, right? Um, so now people, when I mention that, people will say, yeah, but the um, wheat's not the same as it was. It's been hybridized and all this. And now we've got, you know, we've got GMOs, we've got herbicides and pesticides and all that is true. And that plays a role that I, you know, cannot uh, exactly counter, but um, so, so I do believe that people should, if they can afford it, I think they should try to go with organic foods. I think we should try to avoid GMOs and herbicides and pesticides if we can. But interestingly, some of the islands in the South Pacific um, where, you know, the South Pacific has, um, if you look at all, all nations, no, the U.S. has the highest obesity in, of all the developed nations in the world. But if you look at all nations, developed and developing, the top five most obese countries in the world are all South Pacific islands, and they have the most, the highest prevalence of diabetes there, upwards of 37% in some of the islands and 90% um, total obesity and overweight in the South Pacific. But these, they're living in an environment that's really pretty pristine. In other words, they're, they're not getting, um, you know, they don't have the, G, the, uh, the GMOs and the, I don't believe as much anyway. They don't have uh, herbicides and pesticides and nearly the environmental concerns that we do, but yet they have extraordinary obesity and uh, diabetes and, and chronic disease. You know, why is that? But they're, but again, they are getting their food, you know, they're, they're, they're following Western food uh, uh, types of patterns. Uh, let me ask you, what's your position on the, uh, everybody's panacea, the uh, Mediterranean diet? Well, the Mediterranean diet is actually, if, if, if done properly, I think is, you know, I think it's very, 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 it's fan it could be fantastically, perfectly healthy but really no different to me than a 19th century American diet or, um, or you know, a traditional, you know, uh, uh, South Pacific Islander kind of diet or Japanese diet. They're all healthy when you remove the processed foods. Now, the thing about the Mediterranean diet has always been, well, it's heavy in olive oil. Well, olive oil is, you know, uh, at, uh, on average about 10% omega-6 linoleic acid. Um, but it, the range in olive oils is between about 3% um, linoleic acid up to 27% linoleic acid. So in comparison to the seed oils, which range from 20% up to 78% omega-6 linoleic acid, you're far better off with olive oil. But I don't think we need any olive oil to be healthy. I think obviously 19th century Americans didn't have any, but most of the, 95% of the world had absolutely no access to, to any kind of olive oil throughout most all of history um, up through the mid 19th century. And yet there's, there's a ton of evidence that we like, especially 19th century Americans, we were very healthy without it. Jeannie, it sounded like I was setting uh, you and Chris up for a debate. He's starting <laughs> to sound like you. I've, I've heard you say it how many times? Uh, yeah, there's the American version of the Mediterranean diet, which has got a lot of processed foods in it. And then there's the real Mediterranean diet. Well, and I think that's a, a lot of it. I mean, my my heritage is Lebanese. And so, um, you know, and I think it's I've, I've read a lot of things lately about um, a lot of foods that are um, banned in Europe and in other countries that we have in the United States. And most of them are the processed foods. But I think it just consistently goes back to that. It's, it's the processed foods and um, even some of the vegans that we know and love dearly, they 
they say, you know, it has to do with the saturated fats being the issue. But if you eat the whole foods like avocados as opposed to avocado oil, you know, it's much more beneficial. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of really good information here. So, Chris, what would you say you're um, if people are going to use an oil, what would you say? What would you tell them to use or a, a fat source? What would your recommendation be? Butter. I would say, you know, the, the safest thing to do is just eliminate all oils. And if we get into the, you know, the nitty gritty. So, you know, co coconut oil and palm kernel oil are really healthy. They're 2% omega-6 linoleic acid. Like coconut oil has an extraordinary record of success in, in the South Pacific and, um, and, and some other areas around the world. Um, so extremely healthy. But again, you know, your, your, your major organizations um, like, um, you know, Harvard and Tufts and all that they're gonna they're gonna say that you know the coconut oil is not good because it's high in saturated fat, right? And that is just ridiculous. So we, you know, the, the record is very very clean. But but I think every single population um, has an ancestral diet that it's particular to them. They're all healthy once they remove processed foods. It's the you know it's the processed foods that changed all of this, and a lot of that is is, you know, it's three things. It's, you know, refined flours, refined sugars, and vegetable oils. That's, it all comes down to that. Yeah, it's really, it's really, um, I mean, it's very eye-opening, your, your research actually, because just to see um, how we've progressed, because we've actually, <laughs> we've actually regressed. They were doing better before they started adding everything into the diet. They were doing a lot better than we are now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, my life uh, today as a doctor is simpler in a lot of ways. I'm just taking care of patients and helping them prevent disease. Um, but I, one of my major loves is content and epidemiology. It, uh, I was an epidemiologist at Hopkins many years ago, and <clears throat> I remember getting exposed to this thing of uh, dietary epidemiology with George Comstock there. And it was a nightmare and a disaster. And it still is. I noticed that um, you don't have, you're not quoting any of the, the studies where uh, that people are trying to remember what they had for dinner a week ago, <laughs> two weeks ago, three yeah. months ago. Because the reality is most of us can't remember what we had for dinner last night. Exactly. So, <clears throat> um, it, it gets into a causality issue. I, I don't think, again, there's much debate over whether or not uh, obesity is causing this uh, huge health problems. But then the debate really is, okay, what's the root cause? What's causing the obesity? And right. um, I hope we get there. But yeah. meanwhile, as you've pointed out, we're having a lot of success just steering people away from carbs overall and grains I will tell you, after binge watching on your content, I'm not ignoring seed oils anymore. <laughs> so thank you for your contribution. That's good to hear, Ford. Thank you. So if you've got a few minutes, uh, Chris, we'll go into some Q&A. That's the, the advantage of doing a live show. Absolutely. Gilbert, will you give us the intro? Okay, let me see. Jeannie, are you able to get in on the... I just had a real estate problem in terms of my screen and I'm not getting... Okay, here we go. Are you able to get in as well, Jean, Jeannie? Because I think it'd be help, helpful if we've, we've got both of us looking. Okay. Uh, Dwight, we'll talk about metformin uh, a little bit later if we can. JMK, 20... 2921. Is it unhealthy to cook or fry foods in olive oil at high temperatures? Any comments about that, Chris? You hear that a lot. Everybody says cook it in avocado oil. What I thought I heard you say was that you don't need it at all, olive oil. Yeah, the 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 yeah, that would be the first answer I would give is number one is that you, you, you know I wouldn't cook with olive oil at all. Um I would recommend uh, primarily using olive oil uh, cold if you're going to consume it. Um, if you're going to cook 
with oil, then um, I would recommend coconut oil would be the safest choice, again, because it's 2% omega-6 LA. Um, and um, I mean, obviously, lots of people cooked with olive oil um, historically, but again, you're going to get a little more because it's average is 10% omega-6 LA, you're going to get more of the advanced lipid oxidation end products when you heat it. So it'd be safer to not cook with it. Tricky Vicky looks like she's uh, she's already heard your your part about the coconut oil. She uses uh, Moroccan olive oil, un, uh, organic, unrefined, cold pressed coconut oil, mm -hmm. hexane free cold pressed castor oil, and occasional cod liver oil. Any comments? Um, so I would. I don't know about the uh, the castor oil. I don't think I would use that at all. Um, and um, otherwise, this looks like pretty, you know, pretty safe. Again, I would question anybody that why are you using these oils when you could use if you could use butter, if you're not allergic to it, um, the butter will give you vitamins A, D and K2, which none of the oils can give you any of. So again, this is why I said we didn't get into that. But this is why I say that vegetable oils are um, also nutrient deficient. And that's why they don't have any vitamins, uh, any vitamins A, D and K2. Cataracts. I know you've, uh, I've seen some of your other shows and you got pummeled about eye disease. I think we can take a couple of questions on that. Yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. Have seed oils ever, uh, ever been linked to the incidence or progression of cataracts? Not that I am aware of, um, but this is nobody is looking at this because ophthalmologists really don't probably care uh, enough, to, you know, to get into that because we can so successfully remove cataracts. But globally, it's still a huge problem, you know, that we have advanced cataracts. Um, so, but I'm convinced that you know people do get cataracts even on completely ancestral diets, and they go blind with them. Um, so. So, but I don't have an answer to this one. Nobody's ever looked at it as far as I'm aware. So as an, um, not an expert, maybe an input, somebody who doesn't know your space, my guess would be, uh, some of the interpretation would be, ophthalmologists just pop out a cataract. They don't spend much time figuring out why it happened. Is that it? Yeah, Where you know, you? that's it. That's the thing, you know, I've always said, you know, uh, cardiovascular surgeons don't need, need to do, you know, they don't need to know anything about why people develop atherosclerosis and heart disease in order to be a brilliant cardiovascular surgeon, right? The same with ophthalmologists. We don't need to know why people develop cataracts in order to be the best cataract surgeon in the world. You just need to be a great surgeon. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, we don't, we don't, well, you know, we don't ask the questions and we don't try to answer them. Uh, in, in general, I mean, that's the way medicine is, as you know. Great point. We get so many people that are seeing a cardiologist and those guys are plumbers. They're yeah. not. Yeah, they're, they're plumbers that do prevention. We're prevention guys. So, yeah, and they're, and they're not, you know, most of most of uh, physicians, as you know, they're not interested in prevention. And unfortunately, it's just. Yeah, it's. it's yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that's that What's that? Yeah, it's not a great way to, to get wealthy. Yeah, right. You know uh, Tucker Goodrich? I sure do. Yeah, he's a friend. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so the question, yeah. Have you ever collaborated with Tucker Goodrich on CDOs or familiar with his work? He's quite, yes, absolutely. Tucker has done great work. I wasn't familiar with any of his work at all until I heard him on a podcast in 2019. We've got an extremely similar background. He and I, um, we've become friends. Um, I got him to speak at the Ancestral Health Symposium in um, uh, uh, Los Angeles a couple of years ago, I think it was. Um, anyway, so yeah, I really like Tucker and he's done great work on seed oil dangers. And he's not, he has no science background at all. Quite often the engineers and, and other non-scientists make some of the biggest contributions. Oral right. Ruth, olive oil and sesame seed oil have been used in the Mediterranean and Middle East for millennia. Yes, and they have, um, but the, 
the consumption was extremely small, as I just showed in the, the, the uh, graph that I've got eight, uh, 19 colleagues on that paper that is you know, waiting to be uh, or hoping to be published here um, in the next few weeks, we hope. But anyway, yeah, we, we, you know, we've, got, we've looked at all the evidence. And again, uh, that, that consumption was extraordinarily small hist historically. So, Pravoslavnik says, excellent. Thank you for, and for the first time, they're seeing the, the connection between omega 6s, inflammation, diabetes. Sounds yeah. like you've uh, accomplished your goal. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can't eat fat and we can't eat carbs. What can we eat? You need to stop eating. <laughs> I tell you, we've got a lot more problems with people eating too much than we have problems with people not eating enough. That is what's keeping us all in business. Too I, think much it, I think you can eat all the fat that you want, but it needs to be uh, traditional fat. It, uh, vegetable oils are, are a product of the Industrial Revolution. They should be used in your engine for oil. Uh, <laughs> on your bicycle chain and those kind of things, but there should not be eaten in my view. It's very scary. <laughs> so I'm not familiar with black seed oil. Mm -hmm. What is that? Yeah, I do not remember. I know I looked that up at one, one point. People come up with all these, you know, strange oils and, and uh, they, they do exist, but they're all, the thing is, is all of the seed oils are high in omega-6. I, I think the lowest one is um, canola oil, which is 20% omega-6 linoleic acid. And I don't think there's any of them that are any substantially lower than that. So again, the ones that become healthier, like avocado oil is 14% omega-6 linoleic acid and olive oil, 10%, palm oil, 10%. Um, palm kernel oil and, co and coconut oil, 2%. That's, again, this is why they get healthier as you keep going lower in the, the LA. This is an interesting question. So Joy31608 is saying, are you saying that it's a different kind of fat? Yes. So the shift in the You're type of fat produced. Well, yeah. And the type of fat we went, again, we went from animal fat to um to vegetable oils and the the natural oils that are are fats that are in plants those are perfectly healthy so um as my friend kate shanahan said many years ago she said uh nature doesn't make bad fats factories do and i loved that statement um and kate shanahan's done a lot of good work in this area as well um, so again, it's, it's, if you look at, you should, people should look up Google, um, images for, um, vegetable oil refineries, just Google that. And you will see, they look like, um, you will think that they're petroleum refineries because they, a lot of them look about the same because that's the technology required to produce these oils that, you know, the huge majority of them are not just pressed. They go through an, a, a great processing. So are you saying that it creates a different type of fat in the body? Um, I'm saying that when the oils that are produced that come, you know, that go through, um, you know, the, the, the manufacturing process, they're, they're basically, they take the seeds and they're crushed, heated, pressed. Then they're chemically alkalinized, chemically bleached and chemically deodorized before they go into the bottle. By that point forward, these oils have been heated four or five times up to temperatures 400 to 500 degrees Fahrenheit plus. And this produces all kinds of advanced lipid oxidation end products. These are things like 4-hydroxynonanol, malondialdehyde, carboxyethylpyrrole, acrolein, um, 9 and 13 uh, hode, um, and hundreds of other advanced lipid oxidation end products, which are very, very dangerous to our health. And that's what's in these by the time, you know, by the time they're, they're put into the bottle. Well, you know, and then you heat them and you get more of them. But also, even if they don't have those, when, when you accumulate the omega-6 in your body, um, they, you will produce those same 
advanced lipid oxidation end products in your body because of the fact that the omega-6 linoleic acid is acted upon by free radicals. So hydroxyl, ra hydroxyl radicals, singlet oxygen, superoxide radicals, hydrogen peroxide, all those things will create these, uh, these advanced lipid oxidation end products in your body. So you need, this is why you need to get them out of your diet and get your omega-6 LA in your body way back down into an ancestral level. Mm. You know, this is probably too nerdly, too geekly, but I have a couple of slides which show uh, the biochemistry, where those omega-3s are, where the double bond is with the omega-3s, where it is with the omega-6s, and what that does to the actual um, molecular uh, ordering of the fat. So mm -hmm. it, it, once you begin to see that, it makes a little bit more sense. And, and it sounds like you're saying and sounds like Black Tangoose uh, heard you loud and clear. We can eat fat as long as there's nature's own fats. You can eat carbs, oh, just keep them below 100 grams per day. Right. What One caveat there um, um, is that uh, I, I don't think we should eat large amounts of nuts and seeds um, because they're high in omega-6. And ancestrally, I haven't seen any populations um, other than maybe one African population that ha that consumed lots of nuts in their diet. Um, so that was the their, their, uh, the Kung San consumes uh, Mongongo nuts, but other than that, and they're not very healthy. Um, but they're struggling to find enough food, and so that's the, why they resorted to those Mongongo nuts. But other than that, I'm not aware of any population historically that would have lots of nuts. So nuts would be a very, that would be fine, but they're very seasonal and they would be in very small amounts, uh, nuts and seeds, because people just wouldn't be able to get those. So, you know, you just couldn't, you know, in the 19th century, you couldn't go to the grocery store and get two pounds of nuts every week. You know, that just was impossible. To that point, I, uh, as I was, as I have worked with my carbs, I found myself redirecting some to, peanut butter and pecans, you know, pecans are a big regional product for the Southeast. After looking at your, your content, I've steered away from those, done a little bit more uh, almonds and a little bit more macadamia nuts. Yeah. The macadamia nuts are 2% omega-6 uh, linoleic acid. So they're, you know, I think especially when people are needing to get their omega-6 down in their own body, um, for the first three years that I would recommend steering away from nuts and seeds um, to help get your omega-6 down. And then you could add them back in much more safely, you know, at a, but again, low, at low levels. Starving myself to life. I've lost about 80 pounds. I'm concerned about hidden vegetable oils. I'm guessing all packaged foods contain some. I keep my intake of those extremely low. And if I could say, you see the same thing with carbs, and I'm sure Chris is going to say, yep, you see the same thing with omega-6s. Yeah, I think this is a brilliant message right here. I'm guessing all they, uh, they say, all, I'm guessing all packaged food contains some. And that is um, absolutely correct. If, I mean, if there is an added fat in a processed, you know, packaged food, um, show me one that has butter, lard, or beef tallow in it. You, you can't hardly find it. Um, they're all going to have vegetable oils because vegetable oils are dirt cheap. Um, big food manufacturers were selling, um, so the, the seed oil manufacturers sold uh, in 2014 um, uh, 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 per kilo, so a thousand grams of seed oil, for example, in 2014 was 56 cents, I believe it was, or no, yeah. Uh, let me let me redo that. It was I'm sorry. It was one dollar. It works out to be five point six cents for eighty grams of vegetable oil, which is what Americans are consuming. So that's what it costs them to give you a third of your caloric uh, consumption in a day. Costs big food manufacturer manufacturers five point six cents. Right? If they substituted butter for that, the cost would go up sixfold. It would go from roughly six cents up to thirty six cents. And if it's dirt cheap, it's going to start making it into our food. 
Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you have written a book recently, right, Dr. Kenobi? Yes. So we've got an image well, of that. Yeah, well, let me I see can if show I can it. get that image for you. Thank you, Jeannie. And I think Jeannie and I both have patients coming up. So we're going to have to, I'm going to, I'm going to cover one more comment. Uh, okay. And then we'll get to your book. No, okay. that's not it. Timothy, yeah, that's it. Timothy Bliskey says it's fascinating today. Always curious about plant-based saturated fat versus animal-based, or is there no difference? He's not really talking about plant-based saturated fat and as being bad, because I think your point was that uh, coconut oils are not bad. Right. Uh, systemic inflammation does seem to be the driving force for sure. Right. Yeah. So the way, fascinating yeah. topic today. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Timothy. Um, the um, the saturated the difference in is that the saturated animal or you know the animal fats are going to also come with vitamins A, D, and K2. So this is what makes them even even healthier than coconut oil. So I would not recommend, you know, that your co that coconut oil be all of your added fat. I mean, I would, or, you know, all of your cooking fat, I would use, I would try to use animal fat like butter because you'll get the vitamins. Chris, tell us about your book. Yeah. So this is the book, the ancestral diet revolution. It is available now, uh, uh online, wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, books a million, all those. And um, this is, uh, we, you know, kind of uh, hit the surface of what's in this book today, but this book is loaded with this kind of information. And um, I think it'll really help people to get healthy, to help, you know, reverse chronic disease and save yourself, save your life, save your family. Um, and uh, again, I want to tell people that I do not earn a living doing this kind of work. I don't earn any royalties from this book or from the foundations that I work for the, I work for cure AMD foundation and ancestral health foundation. And, uh, I'm, I'm a volunteer as are the other people that work for the, these organizations. And we do this work because we believe in this mission. And our goal is ultimately to do research on ancestral populations around the world. Um, much like Weston price did, but in a 21st century version. And so, Book sales will help to support that kind of research. And I just ask anybody to, um, if they read this book, I'd love for them to uh, give us a review on Amazon, help spread the message. And, um, and uh, Ford, I just want to thank uh, you and all of your team for this opportunity. It's, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much. Anything else to wrap up, Chris? Um, people can find us. We do have uh, for both foundations, Ancestral Health Foundation and Cure AMD Foundation. We have Facebook pages, Instagram and Twitter. Um, uh, so people can go there to find us. And uh, um, that's about it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeannie, any last comments? No, I think it's really interesting information that you're um, getting out there and it's it's helpful. I mean. I continue to learn day by day. Yeah, me too. Chris, you're doing <laughs> Thanks, God's Jerry. work, helping uh, helping us, helping uh, our culture save itself from diabetes. From Keep itself. It I'm trying to. Thank <laughs> you, Ford. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.